Um, let's begin tonight with a word of prayer. Father, help us as we turn our attention now to spiritual things. Help us to put aside the cares and affections of this world and concentrate on you and your word and the history thereof. Pray that you might guide us into all truth. Father, as always, we acknowledge that we need and want your help and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple quick announcements. Here's a reading assignment that you haven't had in a couple weeks, right? So pages 77 to 82, that'll get you caught up. And also, um, just wanted to remind you, your second assignment of the year is due by the end of this month. That is the last class of this month, let me put it that way, 26 June, all right? After that, we go on a bit of a break. We do have a break, not, uh, it's next week, isn't it? Ne next week's, I think, the holiday the holiday is Thursday, but then we have a break from Bible school next Wednesday. We won't have class, uh, so just be aware of that. But all the other days in, in June, we do have class. And then also there is an exam for church history next, well, look, lucky you. You get two weeks since we have next week off. You'll have two weeks to write this exam. But please remind me at the end of class tonight, I, I need to give you, at the end of this hour, I need to give you the notes for that exam, all right? Then we'll post it on Google Drive. And before we get into the Great Awakenings, I want to make two quick corrections on things that I've, I've said. That may, I, this may not even affect your notes, I, just for the sake of clarity. I want to make sure it's out there and said properly. I mentioned that William Carey, he is the father of modern missions, right? He spoke in a church and a pastor named John Rylands told him that if God wants the heathen saved, God will do it without my help or, or yours. And then I said later on, John Rylands actually turned and supported Carey's mission work. I, let me make a slight correction. I had the name right, but not the person. There's a John Rylands Sr. and John Rylands Jr. So Jr. got on board with the missions, Sr. never did. All right, so forgive me for that. I had the name right in my notes, and of course you can see why I would make that mistake, but I, I saw that I had done that or said that wrong. And then also, this is a couple of weeks ago, I had mentioned, I think this may be in Genesis class even, but I'm going to say it now while I'm making corrections. Um, I had mentioned that Irish people, right, that remember how the Canaanites had gone up that side, and that Irish people had been taken into slavery. And I, I, may, I, I don't know if I gave a specific number, but I think I compared it and said there were more slaves taken from Ireland than Africa, something of, of that nature, and that's not true. I was thinking per capita, right? If you look at the total population of Ireland, then there was a significant percentage of them taken, but nothing numerically even close to what happened here in Africa. So it's very difficult to put a number to those things, right? I, I, it's not as if people are keeping good records, but uh, most people say there's around 12 to 13 million Africans that were taken the Irish, you're talking several thousand, but nothing like the Africans. So I just wanted to make that clear that I, I had said I did not make a very good statement on that. Okay, now let's get into the Great Awakenings. Uh, remember, we started talking about this last week with John Wesley and George Whitfield. They're the main figureheads, and I've put their names here at the bottom of this section, so we'll briefly talk about that again, but let me lay a little background. The Reformation has taken place, and remember the British are sending out companies to the East Indies and to the New World, to the West, and uh, the Dutch are doing it, and several other places are now expanding, and this is where we get this westernized world, this culture. The culture of Western Europe began spreading all over the globe. Well, with this, about the same time, around 17... 60 to 1820, you have the Industrial Revolution, kind of explodes, and in, in a good way, I, for industry that is. The steam engine becomes a big deal. So now this is not only helpful with transportation, right, a steam engine, but also for mining. You're able to pump water out of the mines, people can work more in the mines. So that was a big thrust forward for industry all over the world, and then also science and the ability to mass produce things, uh, machinery, engineering in, in general, just massive push forward. Well, now all of these companies that are going, you know, the new world to the west, to the east, they're able to make and manufacture so many more goods. There's more supply, which leads to more demand, which leads to more supply and kind of snowballs and all over the world, but especially in America and especially in Europe, People become very secular, it's all about business, it's all about money, and 
unfortunately, this is just the truth of it, especially in America, people got fat and lazy. And they took for granted that all of this wealth they had, they were sitting around doing hardly anything because they had slaves doing the hard labor. And America kind of lulled into a sleep. And the same was happening in Europe to a certain extent. Not quite as bad as America, I think. Europe was under a different illusion because, yeah, the Enlightenment, I put here circa right about, right about 1685, that's kind of the date a lot of people use. You can plus or minus that a bit. But the Enlightenment, everybody begins to lean, let me just say everybody, but those that are in this Enlightened movement, they start to think that science can answer everything and that science explains away the need for God. Right? So you have some big names, David Hume and some other philosophers. Hume was in the uh, 1700s, mid-1700s. And they're basically, I, I don't want to, I mean, Nietzsche was the guy with God is dead, you know, but that whole movement, there's no need for God. Science explains it all. So Europe was lulled to sleep with the, this enlightenment. And then America with all this, quote unquote, progress and prosperity, so they needed to be awakened. They needed to be shook. And that's what the great awakenings were all about. So the Reformation, things, you know, let's, let's make the church right again. So now you have these Protestants going out. But then when the Protestants went out, they became successful in business. And all of a sudden, everybody is kind of ignoring their spiritual responsibilities. All right, so the, the great awakenings, they come in three different levels. Three different times, let's put it like that. The first great awakening, forgive me for the abbreviations, it's just a lot to spell out here. The first GA, uh, first great awakening. I've put 1730 to 1770. I believe that that's a fair, that, that's the broad version. Some people narrow that down to 1740 to 1750, but. All right, so Jonathan Edwards, this is a name I did not mention last week. Um, he was quite influential in this time. Edwards was in Boston, the Boston area, specifically Northampton, Massachusetts. Massive, uh, let me not say massive, that might be overstating it, but a, a good-sized revival breaks out under his preaching. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this sermon. It's quite famous. Uh, Sinners in the hands of an angry God. How many of you have heard of that sermon? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. You can still find it to this day. You go on the internet, you can read the whole thing. Edwards did. When he was in church, he would read his sermons. That was very, that was pretty much how everybody preached, you know, uh, for the most part. It was very strange to see somebody just extemporaneously start talking, uh, you know, read a verse and then preach much like we do now. This style of preaching that you guys are accustomed to in our church came about during the Great Awakenings. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later. But Edwards, very powerful figure, very uh, you know, he's a very good mind. He, he, he thought deeply about the Bible. He was very much a Calvinist and explained that in his sermons. But he was one of those evangelistic Calvinists. So he believed in preaching the gospel and he did so very well. Uh, he would tell people not to rely on special providences, which is simply saying, do not wait for God to do some great, amazing thing so that you can follow him. See God in every part of your life. So even though he was an intellectual and could think very deep, he could also reach the practical and, and bring the common man into connection with God. You don't have to have this supernatural experience, you know, some ecstatic experience, just in the everyday things. You can see the hand of, of God. Um, the big, the, the, you might not think this is a, a, a profound thought, but he very much st stressed the idea that God can be known. Oh, yeah, you might think, well, yeah, of course, but maybe you take that for granted. But a lot of people in those times thought that was nigh unto impossible. That God simply can't be known. I won't even try, but he encouraged greatly that people do that. Um, it is about the time that Edwards, right? You can see the times that he's preaching. Whitfield comes in on the tail end of this, right? And when I talked last week, I gave you the notes on Whitfield. Wesley's over in England doing more of his preaching. Towards the end of his life, Wesley did come to the States and uh, we'll talk about another man here, Francis Asbury, and how he worked with Wesley for a little while. Um, but, so Whitfield comes in, and now he becomes like the figurehead. He's, he's, the, he's the face on the stamp for the Great Awakening. And all of America is coming together 
and loving this style of preaching, loving the fact that, uh, so that it didn't matter what denomination you were of. When Whitfield preached, tens of thousands would come, and some are, are, uh, some are Anglican, and some are Presbyterian, and some are Congregational, and all of a sudden, you have all these people mixing and mingling and getting saved. And what happens is years later, you actually get the fundamentalist movement. We're going to talk more about that in a couple of weeks, but the fundamentalist movement comes as a result of this because... Up until this time, you had to adopt a certain creed or confession. So if you were a Baptist, you believed this long list of, you know, 58 things or whatever. And if you're a Presbyterian, you got to sign off on, on 182 things. And, you know, this, all these confessions and creeds are very long, very, you know, uh, well thought out. But if you wanted to be in that church, you had to agree with all of it. Well, now you have this interdenominational meeting going on, and people are starting to realize there's this massive division on these little topics that really don't matter much. After the first few big things on the, on the list, the rest of it isn't that important. So why don't we just focus on the fundamentals? And so then people started saying, what are the absolute necessary things we need in order to be biblical Christians? And they narrowed it down, and then you get your fundamentalist movement. So again, we'll spell that out a little more uh, when we come to it. All right, and then you take a, a bit of a break, right? For a few years, people are settling down. They're not organizing as many revival meetings. And then you get the Second Great Awakening, 1780 to 1820. Now, what happens in between this time, you know, is people say, let's get back to those exciting days when we were having these revival meetings, these camp meetings. People would travel for hundreds of miles in their wagon, sleep in the wagon for four or five weeks, while they'd preach every day. They'd preach every day, four or five hours, sing three or four hours. They'd eat together. These, you can see how Christian communities were built. And now these meetings stop. And they go, oh, man, we feel kind of backslidden. We need to get back to the good old days when there was revivals breaking out all the time. Well, as a result, many men start going out preaching and trying to rev things back up. And, and I appreciate their desire for that. At the same time that they're doing this all over New England, and down into the southeast of America, they're also pushing west. Now, this time, nobody had really pushed west. So the westward expansion in America, there was people going west to find gold, and much like, you know, sailing across the sea to find new business opportunities, people were going west in America to find a better life for themselves. And you find some preachers also blazing the trail and saying, as we find these new uh, new towns and new people, let's, let's evangelize, let's preach as we go. So two things were happening there. At this time, during the uh, Second Great Awakening, the Methodist and the Baptist movements, those two groups as, let's say, denominations, grew massively, massively. So in 1770, there were 20 Methodist churches in America. By 1860, there were 19,000 you talk about a massive explosion. Now, this came on the heels of John Wesley. Do not take the modern version of the Methodist church and think that's what was going on back then. It is not even close. Wesley was a fiery, uh, let's say, a, a fervent preacher. And the Methodist church back at that time, when, when if you ever had the privilege of praying with an old-time Methodist, you, you got to come prepared. I've been in the room with an old-time Methodist. I've sat under old-time Methodist preaching. Brother Walt Ziegler, I'll never forget, came to preach for Dr. Ruckman once. And that man, I mean, he, he just walked in, and you, you, could, you just felt like Methodist church had walked in the door. <laughs> he, he spelled out everything the old-time Methodists were. And he got up to preach. He'd say, all right, now open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. And he had that twang to him. And, and he'd say, neither give place to the devil, and I, I'm, I'm getting excited. I, don't, I don't have no idea what he's going to preach about. Neither did he. He read the verse, and then he talked about how to get saved, and he never came back to that verse, ever. By the time he got done, I mean, it was just loud and, and exciting, and by the time he got done, he'd, he'd tell a story and say, all right, that's enough preaching. Shut his Bible and walk off. <laughs> that was it. I, it's just, that's how they do it. They show up for church and preach with all their heart and, and they mean it. And then 
You know, people want to get saved, they'd come and get saved. So very exciting times back then. So the Methodist and Baptist churches grew massively. Bible and tract societies also spring up and become a very big part of, of American Christianity at this point because there's such a high demand for Bibles and tracts. People want to evangelize in a big way. Now, in the Northeast in America, and please don't be too scared. I'm not going to talk about America all night. There is a reason that we have to go through this part of the history, okay? I'm actually going to circle around and get to Africa before we're done, all right? So I am coming to that. Uh, you, you should know, however, during the first Great Awakening, this was the first time that you see any significant number of black people getting saved in, in history. In history, the Moravians were coming to St. Thomas and St. Croix, to the Caribbean, and winning tens of thousands of black people there, Africans that had been taken into slavery there. But then Whitfield, remember, even though he was for the, the uh, legalization of slavery, he also said, we have to evangelize them, we have to educate them, and tens of thousands of slaves were getting saved as a result. It was more than what had been happening in, in Africa and pretty much all of history. So I know that's not the way it, it should have happened, right? That's not how you reach people, but that, that was one of the upsides to it. Now, in the Northeast, what we call New England, during the Second Great Awakening, that part of the country became known as the Burned Over District. The Burned Over District for two reasons. Number one, that area, right, had been settled by Protestants. They had been there for over 100 years. They had heard preaching over and over and over again. There had been so many organized revivals over the last, you know, going al almost a, a century that those people, they had heard, uh, let's say they were burned out for preaching. They'd just gotten burned out. It was camp meeting after camp meeting, sermon after sermon, enough, we've heard it. And then you get a flyer or a track, come to the next, and they're like, no, no, enough's enough. And the, the other reason they called it that is because most of these preachers, it was all about hell, fire, and damnation. So they said, You've, you have preached so much fire onto this part of the country, it is burned over. There's nothing left. We're, we're, we're all held out for now. So uh, as a result of that, we're going to get some false uh, denominations that rise out of this because in the Northeast, they had grown so cold, churches were people would show up with a bad attitude. They'd heard it all, and it just people were now repulsed by it. And after a little while, people said, well, the church has gone bad. So they came up with their own version of religion. This is where the Mormon church spring, springs from. Yeah, I don't know how much you know about the Latter-day Saints, but Joseph Smith was from New York, and that was part of the burned-over district. And he said, religion has just gone sour. I have the answer to that. Let me start a fresh new denomination and fix it all, and then we studied this in our denominational differences class, and he just created a, a monstrous version of Christianity. All right, so I'll give you a couple of the major characters. Francis Asbury at this time, 1745 to 1816. Um, he was from Britain and then came over with Wesley and helped Wesley preach a bit in America. He became, Asbury became, the first circuit-riding preacher in America, full-time. Right? That was what he did, going from place to place. He was the first ordained Methodist bishop in America. And under his leadership, the Methodist church went from 1,200 members to 214,000. <laughs> so just think about those numbers, 1,200 members to 214,000. This guy was extremely busy, much like Whitfield. Asbury would preach about once a day at a minimum, right? Under his leadership, there were 700 preachers ordained. Now, he didn't train all of them, but right, he was over the organization at this time. So that, that's a lot of people going out, and that's why the Methodist Church grew like it, like it did. Um, a couple other interesting notes maybe you want to jot down. He ordained a man named Richard Allen. Richard Allen was the first black man to ever receive that honor in America, to be an ordained minister in any church. Under uh, Asbury's preaching as well, there was another black gentleman, and forgive me, his name is slipping my mind. It, he, I don't know why I didn't put his name in my notes, but this man was illiterate, so he, he wasn't super intellectual. He couldn't do a lot of reading for himself, but he soaked it in when he did get preached to. He became the first man, first black man, 
to ever get invited to preach to a white congregation in America. So some very interesting things happened with that man's ministry. That man I told you about a moment ago, Richard Allen, after he was ordained, he went on to found what is called the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Have you heard of that? We call it the AME. Now, if you go to America and somebody says, I'm in the AME, that's what they're, it's much, much like, you know, the AGS or something. You just use the initials. You may not even know what they stand for. NGIA, you know, most of you do know what that stands for, but we get used to the acronym. So the African Methodist Episcopal Church, that was Richard Allen's doing. Now, you understand why Methodist and Episcopal would go together, right? Remember, Episcopal is another name for Anglican. Episcopal is just speaks to the church government that, that is set up in there, you know, the way that they run the church. So Methodist, that comes from Wesley. Wesley was an Anglican priest. So those two things would very much go together. All right, so the next, the, now Asbury, while he's moving about preaching, you get this man, Peter Cartwright. Cartwright was ordained by Francis Asbury in 1806. And I don't, I don't know how Cartwright got saved. I don't have that story handy at the moment. He had several nicknames, Peter Cartwright did. If, I'm not so sure that I would want Peter Cartwright as my pastor, but when it comes to reading stories about a guy's life, I, I very much enjoy the stories. I don't even recommend that you repeat all of them, you know, like try to replicate them in your life, but he was called Uncle Peter. That was one of his nicknames, not Uwam Peter, Uncle Peter, <laughs> uh, Backwoods Preacher, the Lord's Plowman. He had several nicknames because, whoa, he was a Methodist. He hated Baptist. I don't know why, but he just hated Baptist and uh, would preach against them often. Really, the big difference at that time between the Baptist and Methodist was the method of baptism. Methodists would baptize babies. Baptists wouldn't do that. And then a Methodist also believes you can lose salvation, and most Baptists do not believe that. So I, I don't know what his bone of contention was. Maybe he just had a few bad run-ins with Baptist preachers at that time. That, that, that happened but he was a Methodist circuit riding preacher. So he would ride on the horse like Wesley used to do. Remember how he, he, he rode enough to go around the globe, what, 10, 20 times, something like that. So this was Peter Cartwright as well. Um, he went throughout Kentucky, Illinois, Tennessee, Indiana, Ohio, all through the mid, I want to say Midwest, that's not true, just the middle part of America. He was very much busy in there. He actually ran against Abraham Lincoln, for a seat in the U.S. Congress and, and lost to Abe Lincoln. Of course, he would go on to be the president, so that, that's not too shameful to lose to Abe Lincoln, I guess. Peter Cartwright's stories are, they live on, I don't want, maybe in infamy, but uh, like I said, it's fun to listen to these stories. He would go to a town, and before he would preach, he knew in every town the biggest opposition would come from the bar owner, the, the local tavern owner. So knowing this, he would go to town, and the first place he would stop was the tavern. And he'd walk in, and he'd say, uh, who's the owner? And that tavern owner would say, I am. He'd say, well, uh, I'm the uh, new preacher in town. He'd grab his hand and pull him over the bar and throw him on the ground. He took one bar owner and starts, boom, bam, bam, starts thumping. Because this is what bar owners would do to preachers. As soon as the guy would bring a camp meeting to town, people stopped going to bars, right? They get saved, they go home and spend the night with their families instead of going to the tavern and dancing with, with uh, harlots and, you know, that kind of crowd. So now, Peter Cartwright, these other men, usually the tavern owner would beat the preacher up and that way the camp meeting would be over. And the preacher was, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and you run out of town. So Cartwright, he was a big brawling dude, you know, so I about... I was six foot four. I don't know whatever that is. Two meters and big guy. So he'd go into town. Are you the bar owner? Yep. All right. <laughs> Pull over the, yeah, he, he would climb on top of him in the mount position and start beating him and sing while he did it. All hail the power of Jesus name. <laughs> Let angel. And he, he would sing the song while, and use that guy's face as a bass drum. <laughs> and and keep perfect tempo on the guy's face. He, he went to one tavern one night, and he walked in, and they were having their dance, you know, and the music going on. And so he asked a lady, he, a young woman there, he said, would you like to dance? And she said, yeah, sure, and common thing. He took her onto the dance floor, and he said, now, before I do anything, I always pray. 
and her eyes got real big. And this is that old time Methodist prayer. I'm not going to do it because I have a microphone on, but he knelt down right there and held on to her hand so she couldn't run away. And he started praying, oh, God, and I'm just <laughs> forgive these poor sinners. They're all going to hell. I mean, just, <laughs> and everybody heard it, and she couldn't get away. The band stops playing. Everybody left the bar, and he's left with that. <laughs> That's one way to get it done, right? I'm, that's what, I'm not suggesting that you try that. But if you do, let me know how that went because I, I very much enjoy the stories. Peter Cartwright actually got to meet Joseph Smith at one point. Now, after Joseph Smith has started the Mormon church, we don't have time for all the silly stories, the things that the Mormons were doing. It was absolutely ridiculous. You would not be able to distinguish them from a, a modern-day charismatic. They'd flop on the ground and talk in gibberish and, I mean, just, you know, their eyes would roll back and their weird stuff. And Cartwright met Joseph Smith and called him on it. And he said, I, you know, Joseph Smith starts out saying, you know, if, if the Mormons and the Methodists would just get together, we could take over the world. We, we, we could just do anything and everything for God. And, just, and Peter Cartwright said, I've met too many of your followers. I'd never join up with you. And immediately Joseph Smith turned and said, well, you're just on your way to hell. That's <laughs> right there in the conversation. But Cartwright was not afraid to speak his mind and, and tell somebody the truth and give, give it straight. So interesting character in history. Another man we should mention, Charles G. Finney. Of all of these men, I think revivalism probably, you'd have to link it to Whitfield and Finney the most. Finney had tremendous results, 1792 to 1875. Finney, he, he was a Presbyterian. He started off that way, but then actually turned into an Arminian as time went on and uh, started a group called the New Divinity eventually. But he would go from town to town. And the stories behind this man, the, the way that the power of God would come down during the meetings, it, even as you read about it, I mean, it stirs me. I, it, I've been brought to tears a few times thinking, God, please let me just get one taste of that during any church service. Um, so I, I would strongly recommend, take some time and read about this man's life. Now, I will say this about him, however. It went a little too well, I think, because he got so good at it. He, like, wrote the book on it. He, he bottled up revivalism and said, now, if you want to have revivals, just do step one, step two, step three, step four, and a revival will happen. That, that's not how revivals happen. You can't plan them out like that. You obey the Bible and the Holy Spirit honors the word of God and then things happen as people respond to it, right? You need a wise reprover upon an obedient ear, right? That's what Proverbs says. You, you, just good preaching and step one, step two, that's not a revival meeting in and of itself. So I, I think he probably took that a bit too far. I would be remiss if, it, if I did not mention, along with Charles G. Finney, there was another man that went almost everywhere with him. And this might actually be the like, secret to his success, earthly speaking. Uh, a man named Father Nash. Now, they called him that because he had a, a history in the, I think as an Anglican priest, but they called him Father Nash. His nickname was the Prevailing Prince of Prayer. And before Finney would get to town, Nash would go before him. And he'd show up a week ahead of time and pray the whole time. And I mean the whole time. He would rent a basement, a room from somebody in town, lock himself in, fast and pray every minute of every waking hour. That's all he would do. While Finney would preach, Nash would go under the church, like in the basement area, and just pray the whole time. So the, I, that's, when you got people doing that on your behalf, you can see why God would be welcome to move in such, in such places. Now, about this time... You also get a very strong apocalyptic focus. People, all of this um, energy that is being, oh, you know, everybody's getting stirred up about the Lord. And because of this, a lot of people start thinking Jesus is going to come back. And in order to keep people's emotions running high, you have to dangle something in front of them. So when you tell somebody, listen, you're saved. Now, Jesus can show up at any moment. Amen. I mean, I believe that. I hope it's 
<laughs> I, I hope it's then, right? I hope it's just now. But there's a very good chance that you'll have to wake up and go to work tomorrow and do that for the Lord. See, now that's not nearly as exciting. If we have a revival meeting and I preach to you about how to go to work tomorrow, <laughs> not everybody's going to jump up and go, hey, man, praise the Lord. I mean, that's not that exciting. But if I tell you Jesus is coming tomorrow, well, <laughs> amen, that's exciting, see? So in order to keep the energy and the emotions high and everybody you know, on the edge of their seat, all of a sudden people start getting very apocalyptic. The Lord's coming back at any moment. This is where you get William Miller. He was a Baptist preacher. He was in the burned over district. People are just tired of hearing it. And he says, let me stir them up. So he predicted, and he was in the early 1800s, he predicted Jesus is coming back in 1843. March the, what, 21st, I think, something like that. He's, and, and then he said, well, maybe between 43 and 44, 1843, 1844, somewhere in there. And then this is where eventually that, obviously that prophecy failed. And then the Millerites, his followers, kind of spread out in different directions. They become several smaller groups. One of those groups becomes the Seventh-day Adventist. And then as a result of that, you get a man a little later named Charles Taze Russell, and he starts having Bible uh, studies and teaching people. And actually, in the beginning, he didn't have bad stuff. But he got a hold of Miller's stuff. He got a hold of Ellen G. White's stuff and the SDA, all their prophetical stuff. And Charles Taze Russell says, Jesus is coming back. He'll do it in 18-whatever-whatever, 1940. He kept changing the dates. And so that is where the Jehovah Witnesses came from, is that group. So this apocalyptic thing really... Uh, you can see why people would be interested in it, but because they misinterpreted the Bible in many ways and had to twist some things, ended up quite bad. All right, that brings us to the third Great Awakening, 1850 to 1900. And I would, you know, I mentioned earlier levels. I didn't mean to say that, but that might actually be a good word for this. This one was very much genuine, right? I mean, people showed up and they just preached. And it was a genuine response. They didn't have to force anything. You couldn't bottle it, bottle it up because it had never happened. This was a great time of revival in, in America. It was the Second Great Awakening. Lots of great results. But it, it wasn't what the first one was. And people were starting to learn how to manufacture it. And now some people are abusing it. By the third one, you do. These are not the only two guys. There are some great, great preachers that come about in this time. But by the third one, it has become a bit more commercialized. And then after, I'm, some people have said there's even been a fourth one. That's debatable. And even some people don't believe that this was a true great awakening because it is, it's just not the same as these others. But you still have big revivals going on, thousands of people coming to attend. The best preacher of that time, in my opinion, is we just call him D.L. Moody, but his name was Dwight I think Lloyd was the L, but Dwight L. Moody, 1837 to 1899. Um, he so reportedly had over one million conversions under his ministry. One million. Now, he did visit uh, Europe and, and England and, and do some preaching there, but one million conversions. Now, think about that. After all these awakenings, there are churches all over, but D.L. Moody, what a tremendous story behind him, a very sincere man. Um, again, I, I just, we just don't have time to get into all the stories behind all these men, but if you have a chance to go back and read uh, about this guy, he wasn't super educated. He wasn't a flashy guy. He wasn't even that great of a speaker from what we know. He was just very genuine. He loved the Lord. At one point when he was just getting started, he had two ladies, two old ladies, pull him aside. He was a shoe salesman, if I remember correctly. So not a, not a fantastic backstory, but just wanted to do something for God. Two old ladies pulled him aside and prayed over him and asked God to fill him with the Holy Spirit. And he said, from that point on, nothing was ever the same. Now, he was already saved, but from that moment, he said, something just changed. And everywhere that he would go and preach, God just kept moving and people were getting saved. He had a man that would travel with him named R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey would lead the music during these meetings. So they would sing sometimes, you know, 30, 40 minutes before the sermon. And this is why I'm really excited about what God's doing in our church right now with the music. Because during these meetings, R.A. Torrey would start singing. 
and sometimes it was the congregational, sometimes just he alone would sing, they would sometimes have 50, 60, 100 people come forward and get saved before the sermon ever started just during the singing because the songs were so powerful and it wasn't the beauty of the voice it was the message of those songs that is why guys the songbook that we use you'll see that a lot of the songs come from this period of history especially this last one because they were used during those meetings and they were stirring songs it, it got the job done all right so D.L. Moody he I think one more story about him would be fitting he was in England one time, and he met with a, an evangelist over there, an older gentleman, and they were talking about, you know, how to have the hand of God on you and how to have God use you and bless your ministry. And this older gentleman told him, it has not been seen yet what God will do with a man who is totally surrendered to him. And Moody's response to that was, I commit myself then, I endeavor for the rest of my life to be that man. And you can see, it, 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 even though you may not be as, as um, eloquent a speaker or as educated a man, if you have that kind of heart towards God, you, God can do a lot through that. And then another name that you should be familiar with, C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. His nickname is the Prince of Preachers, 1834 to 1892. Very, probably the, the most famous Baptist preacher to ever live. And uh, his church actually still stands, the building in London, the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He got saved at a very young age, uh, as a teenager, got saved. And by the time, I, it, again, I'm working from memory a little bit here, but I think he was 18 when he took his first church as a pastor. But he was so talented as a preacher that his sermons every week would be printed in the newspaper, in America. <laughs> That's how good it was. And to this day, his books are still readily available. He is filled with good quotes. This man, he would devour books. He loved to read. If you guys are going to be preachers, learn to read voracious. I'm just get as many books as you can in you. And Spurgeon, he has one book in particular I would recommend. It's called Lectures to My Students. I don't think any preacher should go without reading that. I, every preacher should have that in their library. And I think any Christian would benefit from it, to be honest with you, not just preachers. But in there, Spurgeon talks about how important it is to be well-versed in any subject. He would read a book on trees. And he said, now that may not seem like much to you, but if you know about trees and then you read in the Bible about trees, all of a sudden the Bible starts speaking to you in a different way because you know more about trees. He said, read about birds, read about rocks, read about the air, read about anything. Because the more you know about it, the more the Bible is going to speak to you. And, and that is why his preaching was, was so engaging. Because no matter what the topic was, he could give you something that was interesting and applicable and practical. So good, good advice from that. All right, now a couple of things. Take your Bible, come to uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. I want to just mention this real quick. One of the problems with the Great Awakenings was, and, and a gentleman was here last week and brought this up, the emotionalism. During the Great Awakenings, people, Whitfield, Wesley, they're preaching in the open air. You're not in a church anymore. That changes the way people act because the crowd that will go to an open field to listen to a sermon is usually different than the crowd that wants to go to the tabernacle on Sunday and sit nice and stilt in the garrick and that it's not the same crowd. So the the crowd in the open air, those are remember Whitfield was preaching to coal miners in England. That was the first crowd. Coal miners are rough, rugged people. So they don't mind talking during the sermon. So when they hear something, Amen, you know, that kind of they just give you one of those. You wouldn't get that in the Anglican or Catholic church, you know? You'd have to wait for the priest to say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> it's very, so it was a different atmosphere. So people, I mean, they would raise their hand, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and people were starting to show their emotions a little bit. And that's why I say here it was very genuine. But as time goes on, the, it's sometimes a fine line between, did you really mean that amen, or are you just following all the other sheep that are raising their hand and saying amen. Emotionalism, right, 
can easily be mistaken for something, gen some genuine revival. You know as well as I, people can get dramatic and start crying and get all worked up and they're really not, it's just on the outside. And that people realized it immediately with all these revival meetings, the pastor would get up, you know, the preacher would get up, he'd preach. I've, I've seen pastors in this day and age do it. They have their notes, you know, go to this verse, give this quote, and that's fine, you need notes. But then in the notes, it says, cry here. So the pastor will start crying on cue, go, <laughs> I was telling you the other day. Come on. You see, that, that's where you've stepped out of revivalism into emotionalism. And now you're trying to pull on the heartstrings of, of the people, not letting the Holy Spirit do it. You're trying to do it. So Nehemiah 8, you have here Ezra stands up with the book, with, with God's book. He begins to read it. Verse 4, just look at that, 8 verse 4. Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood all these Levites. Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. There are churches to this day that do this. They have everybody stand while the preacher reads his text. Several churches in America do that. Verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Can you see? There's some emotion to this. There's a hand going up, the head's going down, they're saying amen, they're involved. Now, you've had over a thousand years of come to church and listen to it in a different language. People came to church and heard church in Latin, and very few people spoke Latin. So they would just sit there the whole time and go, I hope this means something. They had no, how do you say amen if you do not know what he just said? First Corinthians, right? So now people hear it, and many of them genuinely are getting stirred and going, this is wonderful. Praise the Lord. And it's real. But then the next generation sees it and says, let's get back to what, you know, uncle so-and-so had. That was when, amen. And they would just copy it. And now you can put revival in a bottle and sell it. See, you just properly time your amens and let's all get worked up and, and then you can fake a revival. So yes, emotionalism did become a problem. And another, another problem, I want to say it's a necessity with these things. As soon as you start opening the Bible and saying, okay, everybody, everybody have a Bible? All right, everybody look at it. You open a Bible, you open a person's mind. Now they get to think for themselves. The, the church is not going to say, just believe everything we say. There's your Bible. Now listen to what I say, but there's the Bible. You open, give them a Bible, open a Bible, open a mind. You open a mind, you're going to eventually open a mouth because that person is going to say, no, no, I don't see it that way. And then you open a mouth, you're going to have to open the door because some people are going to leave. <laughs> open a Bible, open a mind, open a mouth, open a door. Some are going to go, and this is where a lot of dissension came in and contention, and people start arguing. I don't see it that way. I think it's this way. And again, this goes back to we need to put down on paper what are the fundamental things that we must agree on, and then we can let some of these other smaller things, if we want to disagree, not a big deal. And that's, so there was dissension. This is where you get so many different denominations because you're allowed to think for yourself. You're allowed to voice your opinion. And as soon as you voice a different opinion, you'll find a few followers. And you get small pockets of people, you know, that says, no, no, I'm a Baptist, but I'm a different flavor of Baptist. And whatever the denomination is, you have that. So that's, that's just one of the consequences of uh, these type of meetings. All right, now, before we're done, I want to tell you about this man, Adonim Judson. If I have to wait on Livingston, I will, because he is a story worth telling. So forgive me if we don't make it all the way to Africa tonight, but we'll, we will get there eventually. Adoniram Judson, 1788 to 1850. He was from Massachusetts, very bright young man. He learned to read by the age of three. Not too many three-year-olds can read. He learned Greek by the age of 12. His father was a pastor of a congregational church, which was much like a Baptist church, but again, the form of church government made it congregational. As he got older, as a teenager, he became more and more rebellious, and he told his parents he didn't want to follow his dad going into the ministry, he didn't want to go to Bible school. He wanted to be a playwright, you know, for drama, that kind of thing, and write plays. So he went to a very liberal university for, for that. While he's at university, he becomes either a deist or an atheist 
he couldn't decide. A deist believes there is a God that created everything, but then that God stepped away and has never had any dealings with humanity. So he said, if there's a God, that's the kind of God we have. He's not interested in us. He just put it all here and walked off. And then a lot of his friends had even convinced him, listen, there's not even a need for that. Science has explained how everything came here. So he was on the verge and teetered on atheism. By the time he finished school, he was hanging out with the worst crowd that you could possibly imagine. And now he starts going out. He's traveling around New York doing plays and things like that, just getting into drama as a young man. One night after a play, he goes down the road and he's looking to go to an inn and just sleep there for the night. This particular inn had, there was no rooms left in the inn. It's a strange story, <laughs> but there was the, the innkeeper said, okay, listen, I, I have one room, but I don't think you want it. And he said, well, why, why is that? He said, the guy in the room next to it is very sick and you can hear that he's sick. So I don't know if you want it. He said, no, no, I'll take it. Listen, I, I'm, I'm desperate. So he laid down and for that entire night, he heard that man groaning, moaning, wailing. I mean, this guy was in agony, horrible agony. And he, he kept thinking to himself, my goodness, this guy, I don't think he's going to make it. And he kept telling himself, but I'm an atheist. Why should this matter to me? It doesn't, you know, if he dies, he dies. That happens to all of us. Who cares? But it kept bothering him. What, what is going to happen to this man when he dies? wait a minute, what's going to happen to me if I die? And that just started to bug him. Right about three in the morning, the man quit wailing. And Judson thought, well, maybe he took a turn for the better. You know, that's what he's telling himself. Well, maybe he didn't. So he eventually dozes off, but he didn't get much sleep that night. The next morning he goes out and he asks the innkeeper, he says, how's that guy that was next to me? He said, yeah, he didn't make it. He did die at that time. And uh, Judson asked him, he said, By, uh, what was the guy's name? And he said, uh, I think his name was Eames, Jacob Eames. That was Judson's best friend at university, the very one that had led him down this atheistic pass, path, that same guy. And this guy was rich. He was a charismatic kind of a personality, a very lovable, lovable guy. He had talked about running for president one day, had all these big hopes and dreams. And he sat there and listened to his friend die all night. And it, it grabbed a hold of him so deeply, he gave up his profession, went back home, 1809, went to his dad, said, I want to get saved. And he made a profession of faith in his father's church the very next Sunday. He went to seminary, got married, and then off he went to India. Had a massive burden to go to the Indian people. He got on the ship with his buddies and their missionaries. They're going to India. While on the boat ride, they start talking doctrine. And they, they said, you know what? We're convinced we're Baptists now. And they make this official. Well, their mission group that was sent them out said, if you're Baptist, we're not going to support you. He lost all of his support. He had to turn around and go back and raise support again through Baptist churches this time. And then in 1814, he headed off to India. As he gets close to India, he finds out that the doors are closed. He cannot get into India for whatever reason at that point. So he goes to the country just to the east, to Burma, what we now know as Myanmar. Um, right after he gets there, his first, well, let's say it this way, his first child died on the ship that the, the uh, wife gave birth while they were going and the child died on the ship just after the child was born so there's already a massive amount of heartbreak uh, now they've had to go to a different place and now they've lost their child when he gets to burma the country is very um, closed to the gospel and the emperor is not really willing to let judson in but he says listen i know medicine i'm trained with that and because of that he had an open door and he said, okay, because of your medical knowledge, come in and help the people. And because he helped the people so well, then the emperor said, you can go ahead and start teaching and preaching, holding religious services. So he did. Uh, he worked on a New Testament translation about this time. And to this day, the Burmese people still, did I put it here? Yeah, by 1837, he finally had it all complete. But he started the translation work very early on. And uh, to this day, the Burmese people say, you cannot improve on what Judson did. He captured every Burmese phrase perfectly, the way we would say it. You think for, what, 200, 
plus you. That's amazing that it's that good of a translation. His wife at the same time started a school for women and for children, so they were very busy serving the Lord together. 1819, he had his first formal service. He preached in the native language, uh, which is impressive. But then 1821, by this point, they'd had another son named Roger, and he dies at the age of seven months. So now they've buried two children. Uh, Anne, his wife, got very sick. She had to go back to America for two years and then came back and, and uh, rejoined him. The emperor, because Judson was making such a profound effect on the people, helping them not just physically but spiritually, at the emperor's, emperor's request went to another city called Ava to start a mission there. Now, you know God's doing something when the emperor is coming saying, please do more in our country. So he went to Ava, and as he was starting to open the work there, some political nonsense uh, flared up, and the Burmese people had a problem with the British. Well, now, Judson is not British, but he has the same skin color. So immediately, all white people became targeted. They became, you know, everybody was suspicious of them. Maybe you're a British spy, you know, underground kind of thing. So Judson got er arrested, and uh, he was dragged to prison in 1824. He spent nine months bound in fetters. Not just nine months in prison, nine months bound in fetters, tied up, suffering from severe heat. It's very hot there. Fever, hunger, and again, we just don't have time. Go read the stories about how his wife would smuggle the Bible in a pillowcase to him so that he could have something to read. I mean, she, she would bring food almost every day to the prison and bribe the jailer to take the food to her husband. If she hadn't done that, he would have died. There was a three-week stretch where she didn't show up, and he suffered horribly during that time, but after those three weeks, she showed up with their third child in her arms. Can you imagine? I mean, the joy and the pain involved, because that's my, and I'm stuck in this prison and there's really no foreseeable way out. But shortly thereafter, Anne went to all the necessary authorities, really risking her life to do this. And by 1825, November of 1825, he was released from prison. Um, by 1826, so not too long after this, Anne dies. His wife passes away. She's only 36 years old. Three months later, Judson had to bury that daughter that they just had. Three months later... So Anne is buried next to that, or let's say the daughter is buried next to that, um, and next to her mother. In uh, 1834, he gets remarried to a lady named Sarah Boardman. They go on to have eight kids in 11 years. So Judson evidently loved children, right? And I, I can only imagine, and I don't even want to imagine how painful this must have been, but three of those children died very young as well. So I just... Tremendous sacrifice that he made. And the reason they were dying was because of the conditions. That's why. They're on a ship. They're in I mean, things were not good uh, for their health, but he stuck it out. By 1845, that second wife died. He did end up remarrying and, and living happily ever after with her. Uh, but in Burma today, it is the third, how can I say this properly? They have the third largest amount of Baptist churches of anywhere in the world. Burma. Myanmar to this day because of that man's influence. So it really did a tremendous work that side. All right, I have just enough time to say one or two things about David Livingston. Um, I, I wouldn't mind splitting this into two lessons, so I made it to Africa. <laughs> All right, Livingston, he grew up in Scotland, right? He studied as a young man to, uh, he was very poor, his family was very poor, but he was a very hard worker. And he would work and go to school at the same time. He'd work sometimes 12, 14 hours in the day in factories. You know, child labor was not a problem back in those days. So he'd work very hard. He eventually studied medicine. And uh, but he had to beg the London Missionary Society to accept him. They didn't want him. He wasn't a very, um, he was a very gr nice guy, very, you know, a kind and approachable, competent, smart guy, but he was about five foot five, so he's about yay high. I think Amy's probably taller than he was, and just not much to look at. Uh, I'm saying this nicely, but I mean, when you read the stories about him, when, when finally people found him in Africa, he had lost almost all of his teeth. 
He had lost all of his weight. He was just a, a bag of bones walking around. He was not very easy on the eye. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, that's just part of the story. So the mission, I don't know if the missionary society didn't want him on that account, but he had trouble getting accepted. But finally he did, and he wanted to go to China. That was his, his heart's desire. A man named Robert Moffat. How many of you know this name? Robert Moffat. Okay. It's a shame you guys don't know these stories about the history. This is South Africa now. Robert Moffat, he translated the Bible. He came in the 18, well, let me say early 1800s. By the 1820s, he had translated the Bible into Setswana. And that was the only book in Setswana at that time. And he lived in a place called Kuruman. Do we know this city? Kuruman, about five hours to the west of us. So that's where Robert Moffat was. Robert Moffat was back in London speaking, and uh, Livingston came to hear him. And Moffat was ta- telling stories about South Africa. Well, Africa at that time. He's just talking about Africa and, and trying to s- drum up interest for missions. And, and Livingston heard him say this. I'm just going to give you a quick snippet of it. Moffat said, do not sit down in lazy contentment. Do not choose an old station. So don't go back to your old, old ways, old life. Put, uh, push on to the vast, unoccupied district of the north. Now, when he says to the north, he's saying north of where he was in Africa. Don't let it stop in Kuruman. We need to go north into the interior because no one had gone there. You're right. Uh, there were slavers, slave traders had gone there, but no missionary. So push on to the north. He says, in that direction, on a clear morning, I've seen the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary has ever been. This, or he said, there, sir, is your field. And that that phrase, that that sentence, I've seen the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary has ever been. That has become a very famous phrase. Many, I've I've, it made an impression on me when I was a younger Christian and many others. And Livingston heard that and he knew this was God calling me to Africa, not China. So he changed direction. In 1841, he arrived in Kuruman. Moffat was not back from London yet. So Livingston came on his own, landed, I believe, in the Eastern Cape, and then went all the way trekking to Kuruman, which had to have, with nobody to guide you, that had to have been quite a, quite a journey. But when he got there, he... He was well accepted by the people. He had a very big heart for them and immediately started learning how to interact. And tonight I think I'm going to finish by telling you about this man, Sechele, and then next week we'll finish Livingston's life. But within the first few months of of meeting, now you guys help me here. Am I saying this correctly? Because in every book I pick up, they spell this word differently. The Bakwena. Bakwena or the Bakwain. I'm not Bakwena, that's, that's how I've heard it. Okay, so he meets the Bakwena, and at this particular time, the Bakwena people are divided. They, you know, the chief was this man, Sechele. I, I, am I saying that correctly? I believe Sechele is, I, that's how I would say it. Sechele is now, like half the tribe is following him and half is with the other, um, the other chief. So Livingston, he's now interacting with Sechele. He says, listen, send him a peace offering. Show him that you're not enemies. Send him some gunpowder gun just to show that you're not trying to attack him. So Sechele did. He sends the gunpowder. The other chief receives it and says, Yeah, but I think he has put juju, eh? So he said, In order to cleanse the juju, I must put fire. <laughs> so the opposing chief put fire. Boom! It blew up and it killed him and several of the people around him. And now Sechele, de facto, has become the the uh, the chief of the entire tribe. Now, I mean, that's that's a sad slash funny story because it's gunpowder. <laughs> Why would you cleanse it with fire? But Sechele was a remarkable man. He begins. He says he comes to Livingston and says, "Teach me to read." So Livingston starts with the alphabet. Within two days, Sechele had learned the entire alphabet, and he gets his book out and he starts writing phonetically every word that he can pick up. He said, okay, that's how you say this, that's how you say that. And then after a while, after writing enough words down, he teaches himself how to read. And he picks up the only book in the Tsitswana language and starts reading it. And it's the Bible that Moffat had put together. And he he read that Bible threadbare. He read the cover off of it over and over again by the end of his life. So this is 1841. He meets Livingston. By 1881, he has read through his Bible more than most missionaries do in a lifetime. 
I mean, this guy was dedicated. He comes to Livingston and he says, you've taught me now about the great white throne judgment. You've taught me about the, this judgment. Did your fa- forefathers know about this? And Livingston said, yes, yes, we did. We've known about it for some time. He said, oh, my forefathers didn't. So I'm just wondering, why have your forefathers not come and told my forefathers about it? What's taking you guys so long to come and tell us? That's a great question. And I think, I think that's a question that stands still to this day. What's taking so long? I mean, there are people that haven't heard a good explanation for the gospel yet. <laughs> this same chief, Sechele, told Livingston in conversation one day, he says, the most fascinating thing, my people will always follow me. My, my, you know, in the village, they always, if, if the chief loves to hunt, then the people will go get a dog and we'll go hunting. If the chief loves beer, the people will all drink and get drunk. If the people love to, if the chief loves to dance, all the people dance. He said, now the chief loves the word of God and I cannot find one of my people that will follow me. I mean, this guy's, um, you're saying the right things, but he is also an African chief. He's a polygamist. He has five wives. He is the rainmaker for his people, so he had to pray down the rain, you know, d- using typical African cultural things. And Livingston explained to him, listen, we don't, we don't believe in witchcraft. That's not right. And polygamy, Livingston gave him the typical European explanation. Now, I'm going to tell you now, I don't agree with Livingston's approach. If you want to know my approach, I give it to you in the Titus commentary that I've, wrote, uh, I've written, so you can read it in there. But Livingston told him, you have to divorce four of your five wives. You can keep the, the original one. The other four that you took after, divorce them. And then and only then will I baptize you. So he didn't take Sechele serious until after seven years, 1848, Sechele says, okay, fine. And he divorced four of his wives. Livingston baptized him. Then, what was it, about a year later, one of those other wives that he had divorced comes down pregnant. And Livingston says, uh, what happened? And he says, yeah, sorry. <laughs> he's, and he, he claimed it. He said, that was my fault. I, I, I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. It's, yes, it was a mistake. Livingston pretty much wrote him off. So you'll hear people say Livingston only had one convert that turned into none convert because he thought Sechele was a saved man. But then after that, he said, ah, I don't think he's serious and kind of wrote him off. And, and people say Livingston had no converts. That's, that's not true. So Chele, even after that event, he still lived and worked around with Livingston, you know, moved about with him. But as of 1852, wouldn't you know it, Sechele is no longer praying down the rain. He stopped doing that. There was a massive two-year drought right about the time Sechele said, I won't do it anymore. So the people are obviously seeing, they think there's a connection. But as a, as a result of this drought in 18, 1852, Livingston had to take and send his wife back to London. And their, you know, I, I think they had a son at that time, send them back. And this is where Livingston parts ways with Sechele. That's the last time they had contact here on earth. Now, I haven't heard about this part of the story until this week as I've been studying for it. Sechele didn't quit. Livingston didn't even realize what was going on, but Sechele continued on. And he had to fight against the Transvaal Bura in order to keep preaching because the Bura Mensa were telling Sechele to keep quiet, but he wouldn't do it. Sechele tried to, cut, to get down to the Cape in order to send a message to Queen Victoria to come and help, but he got turned back by the Bura people and he couldn't get through. So eventually, uh, Sechele just went back up north into the, what we now know as the Northwest province. He went up into what is now Z- uh, Zimbabwe and starts preaching there. At that time, evidently, there was the Zulu and Debele people there. The British sent missionaries later on, 1859, 1860. They sent missionaries to the Zulu people there. When they got there, there are churches set up. And they're, they're singing Christian hymns. And they're worshiping Christ and reading from a Bible. And they said, whoa, wait a minute. You guys aren't supposed to have the light of the gospel. Where'd you get this? And they all pointed at such area. They said, he's been preaching to us. And he's been teaching us the Bible. He went around setting up churches and he ended up having more converts than any European missionary up until that time. No one had the results Sechele had. Now, what Sechele did is he came back 
and settled down in his home area. And instead of having a European version of Christianity, he developed an African version of Christianity, but he did it with a Bible. So he sat down with the Bible and he said, okay, Livingston, other Europeans tell me to live this way, but I want to see it in the Bible. So polygamy came back. Now again, I'm just telling you the history of it. I'm not getting into the doctrine behind it, but polygamy came back because whether you like it or not, you can make a pretty good case for it biblically. I mean, you've got to admit that. I don't teach polygamy, all right? So don't worry if any of you are getting a little anxious there. I don't teach it. I don't think it's right, but it's not as clear, clear cut as some Europeans would like for it to be. So Sechele brings it back eventually, and he writes down the names of ancestors on the church wall. I don't know why he did that. Is he just, re- white people do that too. This building was built by, and we put the guy's name there, <laughs> right? We're not praying to him. We don't think that he's still with us, you know, in the room, but there he is on the wall. So I don't know why Sechele wrote the ancestor names on the wall. Maybe just to recognize it. Maybe just to say, you know, in our culture, we appreciate our forefathers. Maybe that was it. I don't know. So Sechele did, he let some African culture into Christianity. And when the European uh, missionaries showed up, it didn't look like their churches back home. But the problem was when they would sit down with Sechele and say, hey, hey, why are you doing these strange things? He said, let me show you. And he would give them chapter and verse, and they could not convince him otherwise. They couldn't argue, him, uh, argue against him because he knew more Bible than them. They, they said, just, we, the, the cover's falling off his Bible. And they said, no matter what we say, he keeps giving us a Bible verse to prove his answer. And we can't do that. We can't give a verse to prove our answer. We just say, this is what we've done. So he certainly made an impact. And Livingston didn't even know. Livingston thought this guy wasn't even serious. So indirectly, Livingston actually does have, you know, he left quite a trail through this, through this man. But this, yeah, God definitely used him. All right, so next week, there's much more to this story. Let's say two weeks from now, we'll talk more about Livingston. All right, man, we went way over time. I'm so sorry. Guys, I'm, I'm not going to take questions. I got to give you the questions for your church history exam. So let me do that now. Sorry, I took much more time than I thought I would there. I got going on Sechele. I've been wanting to tell that story all day, so I didn't want to skip it tonight, right? I'm sorry. All right, church history. Here we go. Uh, This will be from 1,000 up to the 1,500s. Number one, what was the name of the Archbishop of Canterbury who came up with the ontological argument for God's existence? Again, I'm going to go through these quickly. You'll have access to this on Google Drive. Number two, give the name of the man who is credited as the founder of the Valdensians. Uh, Translating the New Testament into French was a pivotal event in his life and ministry. I'm actually giving you clues here, so this should be an easy test. Explain briefly what is meant by the term Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Number four, what nickname is often used for John Wycliffe. Number five, Wycliffe became the first man to translate the Bible into which language? Name the following man based on these descriptions. And then I give, I give you six lines of descriptions of this guy. So I don't know, there's like 10 different things I tell you about him. Guess that man. It shouldn't be hard. I hope you get that. His name means goose. I don't know if that rings a bell, but anyway. Number seven, briefly explain how the fall of Constantinople in 1453 helped forward the efforts of the Reformation. Number eight, list the five solas that became popular during the Reformation. Number nine, what was the subject of Luther's 95 Theses? There was one topic that he was writing about. Number 10, on which, bu- on which biblical doctrine could seemingly none of the reformers agree? There was one topic that they all had their own opinion about. Number 11, in which city of Switzerland did John Calvin spend most of his time? Number 12, to which specific country did Calvin send several missionaries? There was one place he focused on. Number 13, which country produced John Knox? Follow up to that. Which denomination is he responsible for founding? And then lastly, which issue sparked King Henry VIII to break away from the Roman Catholic Church and start his own church? Oh, oh one more, sorry. Number 15. Name one doctrine and or practice that sets apart the Anabaptist from all other Protestant groups. There's actually, I think, two or three right answers to that, but name one that sets them apart. Okay, so there's your 
questions for the test, you have two weeks to turn that in via email. And let's take a break.